here for losing my site magazine with former Portsmouth, among other clubs, <laughs> defender Lynn Voy Primus. Lynn Voy, thank you for taking the time to do this interview with us today. No problem, thank you. And uh, we'll be getting into all manner of topics here, quite a few about your career and also your faith in football uh, foundation that you've been doing and um, all of that stuff. Um, so if I can, I'd like to take you back to the beginning. Very Just beginning. Going, going back to 1992. Yeah. And you started your career at Charlton Athletic. Um, in a little bit of a different era than the academy system as it is now. What was it like at that time for a young player from, I believe you're from Forest Gate? Yeah, that's right, yeah. What was it like for a young player getting into football at that time? Because it's, it must have been so different to what it is now with all the academy systems and yeah. things like that. I think that. Um, you know, one of the things I realised early on going into an academy uh, was, was how good everybody was because you, in your mind you, you know that, that to, to get there is a, quite a big achievement but uh, then you recognise that the ability, most players' ability is uh, pretty good. Uh, if not as good as yours, better. Um, so I, I noticed that uh, the standard went up straight away. Um, the difference, I'd say, between academies today and back then was there were only 20 players max in your age group, and we started from 14 years old. So there was only 14 years old, 14, under 14s, under 15s, and under 16s uh, in an academy, whereas now you start from under 9s. And there can be, you know, up to thirty kids in that age group, um, all the way through to under sixteen. So, the competition wasn't as as fierce um, in terms of how many numbers are in an academy back if, back when I was at Charlton. Uh, but the reality uh, was the same thing that only a couple, only a handful, were ever going to get through to the next stage and uh, either be apprentices or become pros. So um, larger numbers now, but the same outcome. One or two players uh, being able to get through. And what was it like being an, an apprentice? Because you were one of the lucky players who made the grade at Charlton and spent two years there. Yeah. What was it like being an apprentice? Because again, that is completely different now for the players, the young players who actually do make it. That's right. And um, that has changed so much in, in that time as well. Yeah, that's it. It's, um, I think the apprenticeships back, uh, you know, going back 20 odd years now, um, were very much focused on not just about your playing ability, but your character. So um, we do a number of jobs uh, related to the football club. So that would mean uh, looking after your pro's kit, looking after your pro's boots, uh, looking after the facility. Uh, so that could be cleaning the, the pavilion area where we used to have lunch, um, look, clearing, uh, cleaning the, the toilets and shower area, uh, looking after the maintenance of the ground, uh, the training ground, so that could be all sorts of things like cutting the bushes or you know cleaning your uh, the manager's car, it could be so many different things, but it was part of um, the manager working out what sort of character you were, because it, his thing was if you'd done your job well off the pitch, he could probably trust you to do a job well on the pitch, no matter how big or small. Um, and nowadays, it, I, I don't think so many jobs are done uh, by the apprentices anymore because of uh, health and safety. Um, and there were periods of time where um, people outside the world of football thought that this sort of work that players were doing um, was was on the verge of uh, bullying. So. Um, but for me, I, I'd always say it was good grounding because you had to earn your right. You, you know, you never, you wasn't given the uh, the right to be a footballer. You had to earn the right to be a footballer, and and I think that's um, doing those jobs helped you appreciate the the moment when if you became a professional because uh, those jobs uh, you wouldn't be doing anymore. But you had to earn the right to to get to that place of being a professional. So you would very much say that the apprenticeship gave you that grounding off the pitch that possibly doesn't happen. I mean, obviously mm. the football is now they're grounded. But. Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, it, society's changed, so I think there was a lot of uh, jobs going 
around you know in the early 90s late 80s early 90s where you had done your apprenticeship and it wasn't um you know you come into a job and you'd start at the bottom and it's exactly the same in football you worked your way up and um so but i think society's changed now where you come in and you know to come in as a professional footballer you don't have to do those other jobs anymore so it's, it's a different feel to to what it means to be in a a footballer now than what it was back in the you know late ninety late eighties early nineties. For better or for worse, do you think that change? Hmm, good question. Um, I think it's for for worse personally because I think the the appreciation um, for being a footballer has uh, has changed. Um, you know, you can be eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one years old be in full-time football employment and still not play the first team game, but yet your lifestyle says that you are a, a professional footballer. Um, so if you've got a grounding outside of football, that will really help you be a, a, you know, a more all-round uh, person. So um, I don't think it would harm any player to, to do something outside of football uh, to make them appreciate their their opportunity when they get to play games and and have a, and and the other side of that is seeing the real world because when you, when you're in the football world you're in a bubble um, but the real world there's a lot going on and I think there'd be um, a lot more appreciation of the positions they're in um, and um, the opportunity to go on and and work very hard to to get in the first team at, at a club. So two years at Charlton. Uh, left there in '94, yeah. and you mentioned the grounding you got from being an apprentice. But you then went after the spell at Charlton to Barnet, mm. who were they full time then? Because I yeah. know they were. I know they were in Division Three. What was then Division Three? That's right. What's yeah. now League Two? Yeah. Um, but I can't remember if they were. They were full time on the on the bubble or not. Whether yeah. they were sort of one of those yo yo from. Division three to whatever was yeah. below that then I can't remember it's probably a conference, um, but that again lower league football because mm. Charlton were division division one, one yeah division so one the uh, they just got relegated from the Premier the old it was a, yeah whatever it was it we just got relegated from yeah. the top league into yeah. the second league and then um, but then when I went to Barnet the, they were division three and uh, obviously the lowest tier in the football league but they. They were a club coming through quite a difficult financial period, uh, which I d didn't ever um, experience, but I'd heard the stories. And with that, that time there was, uh, for me, was where I grew up in, in, in the world of football, because I played a handful of games for Charlton in the first team, and things were nice, the training ground was nice, and uh, the ground was nice. But when I went to Barnet, um, you know, we, we sometimes we had to, literally turn up somewhere and train you know we never had our own training ground for for, for a while um, and then Underhill was your very old stadium um, you know there was a slope from one end to the other that was so uh, so big that you hoped that you're playing downhill second <laughs> half and things like that so um, but for me everybody was in the same boat financially everybody's in the same place uh, lots of players had young families um, so uh, I was a young dad as well and um, so socially we done a lot together um, and that really helped us as a team um, on the pitch because we were together off the pitch as well so it was a great time um, you know and and I think that's where I, I became I turned from boy to man because um, that time of playing was guys really <coughs> Guys who you were playing against were coming to the end of their careers, so they were trying to, you know, do their best to keep to keep in the game as long as possible. And um, the other side of that, there were young players trying to get into the team and establish themselves in the football league as well. So it was a it was a good combination. So having gone from Division One or the second tier, whatever, to Barnet, how much was like you mentioned there, just turning up somewhere and training, that must have been quite a culture shock. <laughs> it was, but it was, it, you know, when you when you set out as a, as a kid to play football, um, 
and you become this professional, there's no guidelines to say what being a professional, um, you know, what it's going to look like. And when you're in it, you know, whether you're at the, if I was at Man United and I've seen their facilities and then I'd gone to Barnet, that would have been very difficult to, to handle. Um, but for me, it was a case of I'm playing football, I'm able to look after my family and by looking after my family, playing football, um, I was doing the thing that, you know, most boys my age would love to do but weren't doing. So a bit of a culture shock, but it was good. It was a, it was a great learning, uh, learning curve for me. It comes back to that thing again, doesn't it, of being appreciative for what you had for yeah. the apprenticeship at Charlton and then just you know, being grateful for the fact that you still had a professional contract at Barnet. Exactly, at yeah. that time. Yeah. And we've seen, of course, a lot of lower league clubs since, a lot before them and a lot since that have struggled. Mm. Three years, I believe, at Barnet, 97 you left. That's right, yep. yeah. And moved to Reading. That's right, yeah. Who at the time were Division one, yep. I want to say. Yeah. And so that was moving back in the direction um, of the Premier League where you had started in a way. Mm. Um, so moving up from Barnet, did that make you well, you said you already you'd appreciated at Charlton, but did you, when you went back to Reading and it was possibly more stable than Barnet had been mm. for financial reasons, yeah. was it sort of a sense of relief that it was somewhere that, you know, you had a training ground and you, know, you were back mm. where you'd started? Essentially? Yeah, I think, you know, my, when I left uh, Charlton, I, I really, that it was, it was a difficult time for me because uh, I felt it was the first time I faced rejection, first time I'd uh, failed, um, and, and there was always this burning desire to prove them wrong. So moving to Reading financially was, was amazing. Uh, bought a house, had the car, had the lifestyle um, that I'd seen uh, a lot more of in the few years of being a football I'd seen um, a number of my friends having you know that those sorts of things I thought those you know that that's going to be a you know something good for me but I still wanted to prove that I'd met, uh, that Charlton had made a mistake for letting me go so um, even though I had all those nice things around me the, the, the thing I needed to do was play against Charlton and um, unfortunately Charlton and Reading were in the same division and I was able to do that um, so the facilities at Reading were, were great. We were on the verge of moving to a new stadium, so everything on paper looked really good. Um, but the thing that was going to satisfy me most was playing against Charlton and hopefully beating them and uh, having the opportunity to say that you know they'd made a mistake. So uh, I had that opportunity to play against them. We did beat them, and um, you know that was a, a moment for me that I, that signified something that it was a benchmark for me really um, and then everything else that came along with that at Reading was was a case of proving myself in that division and uh, just trying to be a solid stable defender. Was that game the Reading chart was that at Reading or was that at the Valley? That was at Reading, that was at Reading yeah. Did you ever get a chance to play at the Valley when yeah. you were at Reading? Yeah a couple of times I, I was able to play there and um, and it was nice because Charlton were very much a family club, so a lot of the staff and um, who weren't involved in match day um, was was still there, um, and it's good to go back and you know them saying nice things about me and when I performed there and things. So that was nice, and um, you know again it was a a moment for for me to appreciate that you know, playing football, whatever level you're playing at. Um, there's people that appreciate you for what you do and what you've done for them, so uh, that was nice. And what was it like at Reading at that time? You mentioned they were just about to move to a new stadium, which, if I remember, is the one they're in now, the Matoski. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And I believe he was their owner as well yeah, at that's that correct. time. So what was that like to be at Reading during that time when it, you know, a new stadium, and we've seen that now with teams moving to a new stadium, mm. we've just seen it with the West Ham, of course, moving to... 
can't. Oh, I Olympic, should call it Olympic. the London, but it <laughs> yeah. sticks in my throat. I want to call it the Olympic Stadium, and yeah. I'm going to the Olympic Stadium, and we've mm. seen that that hasn't necessarily worked out that well for them in the early days. And of mm. course, Arsenal moving to the Emirates from Highbury. Um, so, what was that like to be at Reading at? What must have been quite an exciting time, you know, new stadium, new investment, and only yeah. who wanted to see the club go places. Yeah, it was an interesting time for us because uh, because the investment that was going into the ground, there wasn't much investment going into the team. So we, um, the dream of obviously going up uh, into that division, playing for a team that were uh, were trying to progress and move forward, uh, we felt at times as players that. Um, that was being that was more important than actually what was going on on, on the pitch, and uh, and in the end during that season we struggled with injuries, and uh, and with struggling with injuries, um, you know we ended up getting relegated. So our first season in the uh, Majeski was in League League One, um, and then you had what we as players recognise is that you had the legacy of what the team had done before uh, where they would got to Wembley you know playoffs and stuff like that so we always lived in that shadow um, so that was that was an interesting time for the club but you know John Majewski very very uh, sensible chairman he was never going to pour money into something just for the sake of it he wanted uh, he wanted stability and if that meant stability off the pitch first then we could work with things on the pitch. But when you're a player, you just want success. Um, so, um, yeah, I think we, we ended up being in a position where uh, we could have, in my time, we could have had better days, but they, you know, the foundations were, were definitely set in place for what they achieved uh, over the, you know, the next 10 to 15 years of, of Premier League and... Um, Promotions and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. So they, they, you know, they've done it the right way. Definitely done it the right way. And then from dropping into what was at the time Division Two, you got the chance to move back to Division One when you came from Berkshire to Hampshire. Yeah. And signed for Portsmouth in two thousand. Yeah, that's right. And the manager at the time. Mr. Pulis. Was Tony Pulis. Yeah, yeah. And we've actually discussed that. In the last interview, I did interview as well <laughs> with uh, certain things that are said about the way he plays mm. uh, football. So you got the move back to Division One, and you came to Portsmouth, and you said you'd been at a family club at Charlton. And yeah. something you hear from all the ex-Portsmouth players is that Portsmouth can have that feel about it as well at times. Yeah. yeah. So what was the move to Portsmouth like in two thousand? Because they hadn't been a Premier League club mm. at that point since, well they'd never been a Premier League club, they hadn't yeah. been a top flight team since the 1950s. Mm, yeah. They'd hit rock bottom in the 70s and were very much on their way back. Um, and I think Milan Mandrick, was he the chairman in 2000? Yeah, I can't was, remember when he yeah. took over. So yeah. um, just get your thoughts and your insight into what Portsmouth was like yeah. at that time. Well when I came to Portsmouth, um, it was on the, the, the the back end of a quite a tricky time at Reading in terms of contracts and uh, my wife's health and things like that. So when I came, it was more about getting uh, getting somewhere where I could play at the highest level possible, um, and also getting that security again because uh, I, you know I felt quite vulnerable as a player um, because of the the way the last uh, year had played out with with Reading. Um, so when I came to Portsmouth, there was a few players I knew. So I, within the first week, I felt very much part of the uh, the, the squad, um, and then within you know a, a few weeks, uh, signing a contract, I, I, I recognised that you know as a club, um, you know the club were coming through, transitioning through uh, again, which was a tricky time for the club. So. I knew again that I was part of this rebuild that was going on, um, and you know I, I know I wasn't first choice to to come in, and I know there's other players who were who wanted my position, uh, who were 
being touted about coming to the club, but uh, I got the contract and um, you know just it started very well for me. You know, but then even though my personal performances were good, uh, the club's uh, the team's performance wasn't great and it, in the end Tony Pulis suffered for that and ended up um, leaving the club after a few months and we had Steve Claridge for a couple of months and then we had um, Graham Ricks so in the first year you know the first season I had three managers which was interesting um, and again that sort of puts you on a, a little bit of a position of well does he want me here does he you know is my future long term future here um, but I could also see the and feel the passion of the fans in terms of, you know, they they weren't pleased with the way things were going under Tony, and they voiced their opinion. Um, there was a little bit of a, um, a happy period when Steve took over, and then uh, a little bit of a mixed period when Graham Ricks came in and took over. So I experienced quite a most of the emotions the fans were uh, were feeling at that time. But I did know that when we got it right, you know, the fans were so passionate and probably uh, at that time, uh, without realising uh, for years on, but they, I started to recognise that they were probably the best fans I was playing in front of. Um, and I experienced that in a greater way when we um, you know, ended up getting to the Premier League. How tough was that in your first season at the club to go through three managers? Because we've seen with England now, they've been through three managers since the end of the Euros. And that was very much something said about Wayne Rooney is that he's having to adjust to having a lot of new managers in a very short space of time. Yeah. So how tough was that as a player to be in what you thought was a rebuilding process, but mm. then the manager keeps changing? Yeah, it's a, that uncertainty isn't good. Um, you know, especially if you don't know the history of the club. So what I mean by that, if you've been at the club a, a few seasons and you you'd sort of seen uh, changes in the past, you then sort of understand that, okay, if the change is coming, this is where I stand in that. But when you're a new player and that happens, you, you, you know, there's a bit of vulnerability there because, you know, if a new manager comes in and says, right, I want to change, you know, the whole of the defence uh, because that's what I want to do, the likelihood is the chairman's going to back that manager. So, you know, you're a, you're a bit insecure, a bit vulnerable. And, um, and I think that was, the case for most players in in and around the the team in the squad, uh, because the dream obviously was to to be a, a team pushing for the top part uh, top half of the table, um, and eventually you know a team that would be play, playing in the Premier League. But the reality of it, how it was going to happen, couldn't quite be seen because um, you know they, they, we just never seemed to get going as a as a team and. Um, and Milan, you know, rightly so, made some, you know, some tough choices because it's his club, um, and eventually those tough choices um, brought him uh, to a place where he f he felt he found the right man to, to take the club forward. Who would have who would have sort of experienced players at that time? It would have been Alan Knight. Knight, see, uh, he was coming to the end. Claridge, Guy Whittingham, uh, Andy Orford, Scott Hiley. Um, Carl Tyler, uh, there's a there's a there's a number of you know guys who were in the the back end of their careers, um, and I think that's where you get that mix of if you've got a few senior players and you've got a few young players and you've got manager wanting to bring in his own players, um, you can just see where the dynamics um, can be can be a little bit tricky, and for a manager to to manage those dynamics as well as get the results on the table um, can be a, it takes a bit of a skill to do and um, so you know it was a it, like I say it was an interesting time and and I think in the end you know Milan made some tough decisions but some decisions that paid off um, paid off in a, in the long run. The road to the Premier League and we'll get a bit to that in a minute but it wasn't all an easy ride for the club. Uh, there was a young goalkeeper at the time uh, who sadly uh, was lost far too young, Aaron Plyhaven. Yeah. How tough was that? Because you would have been around the club at that time and he would have been coming through, you know, taking the number one shirt from Alan Knight at that mm. time, I would guess. 
how tough was that as a club to to come to terms with yeah that was difficult like that yeah that was really difficult because uh, Aaron was a friend to everybody and um, and previous to that he'd, he'd had a couple of moments on the pitch where he'd, he'd passed out so um, you know I think a lot of people took Aaron to their heart because he was such a hard worker um, but could see that whatever this thing that was happening to him while he was playing wasn't great so you know you really sense that you know you wanted him to to you want the best for him because he was a, just a good guy um so when you know when he when he passed away it was it was one of those moments you you never ever believe a teammate will 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 pass away uh, not under the circumstances he did as well so it galvanized us um you know a lot of a lot of tears, a uh, lot of you know questions about life, um, and, and I think with that, you know, the the moment comes where you start to realise, you know, as important as football is, uh, there's something else that's uh, far more important, and uh, football took a a very um, a very big second place uh, because we knew that this wasn't this would affect not just the football club but the football community. That was. Do you feel that was something that bonded the team together and made you, if it was possible, more determined? I know you mentioned that football, obviously, mm. as it would do naturally, takes yeah. the back seat in that situation. But did that bond the team together and you know, give you that extra you know, motivating factor to get yeah. promoted? Very yeah, um, I don't know. To be honest, I I, I wouldn't say. I think there were so many emotions at that time. You know, when you were going out onto that pitch, you, you know, the obvious thing was that we want to do it for Aaron. Um, but I think there was a there's a sense that life is so fragile that um, you know whether you win, lose, or draw, um, that's not going to change what's happened. Uh, so I think most players were in that mindset of you know we we'll give our all um, and hopefully you know whatever results we get, wherever the outcome is, uh, we know that we, we, we couldn't do anything more. So in that sense, it probably did galvanise, but I don't think it was that that uh, that significant thing that said, you know what, this is going to help us get promoted, um, because it, like I say, football at that point was there, but life was more important, and, uh, and I think that's really what, what the players saw and what the players were dealing with. So it went through all that turbulence and the ups and the very downs. And then 2002, in came a manager, formerly of West Ham and Bournemouth, mm, yeah. called Harry Redknapp. Yeah. And from there, the foundations were laid for what happened in 2002 and 2003. And you were very much a part of that side. And what was it like to be part of the side that won the last team to win the Division One title? Yeah. Of course, it changed the following year to the Championship. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> oh, so that, that's nice to know that then. Um, what was it like? It was. It was one of those. In anyone's career, if you look back and you uh, have special moments for me, is you know one of the most special moments because we at the start of that season we weren't favourites to get promoted. Um, you know, playoffs were 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 a target. We were signing players who um, were household names in terms of playing in the higher divisions. But I and I again, without knowing the, the full history of Pompey at that time, uh, this had happened before. So it wasn't a case that we, uh, you know, uh, a big player would come in and things would be amazing straight away. Um, but we we recognised after the first four or five games that you know we could do something quite special here, um, and I think there was always this belief that we could get promoted, but it was the case of will it happen? Will it always be, you know will it be just too far for us? Um, but you know come the end of the season, us being you know promoted as champions was really good and. I think every single player uh, that season played um, the best football of their careers up until that point, um, and you know that that played out with the strikers. You know, Toddy scoring twenty goals.
goals that season. Yakubu coming in and um, you know scoring a, a probably 10, 10, 12 goals. You had Vincent Pericard and you had obviously Paul Merson who was pulling the strings, Tim Sherwood, Steve Stone. So, you know, you had players who were who were at the end of their careers, uh, but the momentum of what we were doing as a team was um, bringing the best out of them as well. So we had, it was a, a, an amazing time. Um, and then you realise again for the fans how special it was because, um, you know, I, I remember many times running back and, hearing the crowd cheering and it was like it was, the, the noise was carrying me along um, and that was a regular thing week in and week out so, and that home and away and you just felt invincible that was the feeling we had that in invincibility that uh, you know even if somebody's gonna do their best to beat us you know they're not gonna it's not gonna be an easy game for them how important were players like Tim Sherwood and Paul Merson, players who'd played in the Premier League, had won Premier League titles, had won FA Cup titles, mm. to, I suppose, provide that sort of, the ex the real experience of what it needed mm. to get promoted to some of the players who then, obviously after the promotion, went on to be very good Premier League players, yeah. yourself, of course, included in that. Thank you. Um, I think what these guys brought was... Uh, a calmness, uh, a professionalism that uh, where performance week in week out had to be very of a high standard. Uh, you know, they would never accept anything less than you know the the uh, the best you could give. And um, you know, and very much if players weren't pulling their weight, they'd, they'd be told. You know, these guys weren't scared to tell tell you if you weren't pulling your weight. So um, their experience, <coughs> their value of how much it, football meant to them, rubbed off on the team. And uh, and like I say, I think the enthusiasm of the, the players who weren't recognised as uh, your world-class players or your you know in, in, international players, I think the enthusiasm of seeing uh, myself included, those guys um, really giving it their all and, and not holding back, I think that helped them you know, in the latter parts of their careers because they could have come to Portsmouth and just picked up a, a nice wage and you know retired after a few years but um, you know I think just the momentum of everything and the fans you know the fans demanded that we produced you know hard work first and then the ability to play well uh, came uh, like uh, like a handshake really if you play if you work hard you know we're going to play well and that's what they saw and uh, and they appreciated that as well so I think the combination of, of everything allowed us to to see probably the best period of football, um, you know, over the last fifteen years or so. You mentioned in the Svetislav Todorov twenty-five goals in the promotion campaign, but it wasn't a good start to life in the Premier League for Portsmouth because he got injured, I think, in pre-season training. Didn't yeah. He was out for the entire season. That's it. Yeah. Which wasn't a good uh, start for Portsmouth. But was that the year that Teddy Sheringham? Came, yeah, came that was him. Yeah, yeah. Again, to provide a lot of Premier League experience, formerly mm -hmm. of Manchester United and Tottenham, and yeah. won the treble. I think it was there. That's right. Yeah, United won the treble, ninety-nine. So you sort of you lost someone who had been there in the promotion, but gained a very valuable player. How mm. tough was it to adjust to life in that top division? Um. Well, to be fair, you know, the first few games, we, we started off really well. Um, I think we beat Villa in the opening game. Uh, and I think we picked up a point against Arsenal and somebody else. So for the guys, it just seemed like they, you know, they were, it was normal uh, to be there. Uh, it was a bit frustrating for me because I wasn't in the team. Uh, I don't think I made the squad. Uh, for a, for a few games, um, and then I was on the bench. So it was frustrating to watch, knowing that I'd been part of uh, you know such a, a good season the the year before. Um, but I think you know Harry in Milan, and uh, and the recruitment guys had brought in some good players who um, who were hungry to prove themselves in the Premier League. And by wanting to prove themselves, they again kept the momentum going of what we'd uh, 
started the season before, um, you know, Dejan and Stevanovic coming in, he was just uh, such a solid player, constantly um, performing well, whether it's training, whether it's in, on match day, um, and a good person around the dressing room as well. So you had good characters, and, and, that, and I think that's what really helps, um, you know, teams that are doing well, the characters you bring in, you know, if you if you've got somebody that comes in who is big time and doesn't want to pull, pull their weight, you know, they get found out and it causes uh, disruption in the team. But Harry was quite good uh, in terms of getting the right characters in uh, to complement each other. That game you mentioned there, one all draw against Arsenal. Mm. I've got to ask this question, was it a penalty? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. You know, I was in the stands watching that game and I could see it wasn't a penalty. Um, but, you know, that's where... That you, know, you think that we, even when we played them at Fratton Park, there was a I think we drew one all or two all I can't remember, and you know we were probably one of the closest teams to stopping their you know invincible run, um, but it wasn't a penalty, and uh, and I think uh, Perez didn't play in the game at, at Fratton Park because uh, <laughs> Wenger knew that that would be enough of a motivation for the fans to to get us going, and uh, so he left him out of that game. So yeah. It, it, it wasn't a penalty. Yeah, I remember, always remember that 1-1 uh, one, one draws. I remember going past Fratton Park that day and seeing all the coaches departing to, I think, well, still Highbury. Yeah, it was, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. All the coaches departing with all the Portsmouth fans were very excited for us mm. to make it to Arsenal and we were even one for a lot of the game and then that result comes yeah. through. And of course, Arsenal going, as you said, to uh, complete the invincible season. Mm. So, the Portsmouth and the Premier League progressed for few years and they were able to do what doesn't always happen and they came up, stayed up in the first season and survived the second season which has at times been a trouble as well for teams but it was the fourth season I believe 2007-2008 and it was for FA Cup moments mm -hmm. that the club grabbed the headlines and not the league form. What was it like to be around the team at that time, because it started in the third round, and I can't remember That's the right, yeah. game. I can, the only games I can remember from that is the quarter final against Manchester United. Yeah, uh, that was a. I still maintain to this day it was a penalty, but I can't remember who scored it. Uh, Sully Montari. Oh, Sully Montari. Yeah, I, don't know yeah. why. I had it in my head. It was Milan Barros. So I think okay. he might have won the penalty. Yeah, he did. He won the penalty. That's where I got yeah, that from. Yeah. The semi final against West. That's Cardiff. Cardiff. No, West Brom. No, it was West. Yeah, West Brom and yeah. Cardiff played Barnsley and then yeah. Cardiff in the final. At what point did it set in with the players that they had a chance? Because that was a, a mad, mad year because mm. I go to watch non-league football and I was there on second qualifying round day having a Waterloo against Bognor and the round after and the round after and they kept defying the odds. Mm. And that was also, you know, Swansea fell in the third round a result that nobody thought you know the club could pull off then there were big results in the fourth round that came in mm. and Liverpool went out in the fifth round to Barnsley yeah and the semi-final lineup shows you what a mad year that was in the FA Cup what point did the players really think you know we've actually got a chance yeah. of winning this I think it was when we beat Man United you know I think that was the moment where you you know, if you go to Old Trafford and you get anything, you're, you're really happy uh, because not many teams at that period of time were getting results there. So I think when you beat Man United and the way we'd beaten them as well, we, you know, we, we were very lucky on the day. Um, uh, but you just think to yourself, well, it, this could be it. And, you you know, that semi-final at, um, at Wembley, you realise then that you don't want to just go there for that game, you want to be there for the final as well. Um, for me, I, I suppose I was in a position, because I, I was injured that season, uh, I didn't really get caught up in the day, uh, match day stuff, so I didn't feel the nervousness of any games during that season. Um, but I remember watching that United game from at home and uh, thinking to myself, before the game, you know what, if we get anything today we've done you know we will get a replay that'll be the best we'll get and then it's you know 60 odd minutes I'm thinking oh they ain't scored yet you know <laughs> we might have a chance here and then uh, and then all of a sudden we get a penalty and I'm thinking to myself oh my word we're going to beat United um, 
and then all of a sudden you, you, you beat them and you think to yourself, well, this, this really could be it. Um, and I remember coming in the following day, uh, I think it was the Monday, and uh, being in the treatment room, and the lads were, you know, really buzzing, really buzzing, and, and you know, there was a there was a self belief, and you got to remember we were playing so well through that season anyway that, where, whoever we played away from home, um, we just seemed to be getting results after a result after result every time. Home form wasn't great, um, but the away form was good. So you just knew that because of the form we'd been showing that if we were to go out uh, at any point um, after that game, after that Man United game, it'd be a uh, great opportunity missed because, like you say, I think it was you know two or three um, championship type sides were were still in the, in the uh, in the final uh, semi final. So you know if there was ever an opportunity to win it, that was it. Yeah, Portsmouth very much a young team out there. Yeah, the only mm. Premier League team to make the semi finals, as you said, there yeah. three championship teams. Because West Brom had uh, been relegated, I think, mm. a season or so before that. Yeah. Semi finals at Wembley. Just step away from football on the pitch for a minute. Mm. It's always a, a topic that raises discussion. Do you think the semi finals of the FA Cup should be at Wembley or do you think it should be reserved for the big final mm. days? You know, before we played there um, in the semi final, I, I was one of those that said definitely have um, the semi finals at you know a neutral ground. But when you get there and, it's, and you're, you're part of it, you're like, oh wow, this is great. So have them here all the time. Um, because there is a, there's something so special there really is and and I think that appreciation of how big the English game is comes to light uh, with the you know the FA Cup final um, but that semi final allows players to to experience something that um, if they don't get to the final is something quite amazing um, but you know again being a uh, somebody you know old school in terms of having the semi final elsewhere. That's still there is something special about just having your one big game of the season at Wembley. Um, but like I say, if I hadn't experienced it, I'd probably still be in that camp of uh, yeah semi final in neutral ground. But having experienced it, um, yeah, I think the semi finals at Wembley are are pretty special, pretty special occasion. So the FA Cup final, you said you were injured for that season, but I think you were still in some way part of it. Mm. The first, if I remember correctly, first FA Cup final at the new Wembley, must have been quite a special moment for the club to be you know, one of the teams you know, raising the curtain, essentially, on the new era of Wembley. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, some of the guys would have played there, you know, if you've got to remember, we our team was full of internationals, so some of those guys would have played there for England, um, you know, Croatia um, as well. So, you know, there, there, there are a number of players who had experienced Wembley before. Um, but like I say, the FA Cup final, I can't remember the, 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 the amount of people that watched it, but I think it was a record for how many people across the world had watched that, that final. So the, the magnitude of that game was, um, was you know, something quite unique um, and you know it could be overwhelming but I think on the day you know we were fortunate you know we didn't play it that well um, but we were always in control and I think if we were ever in a position where we were under any pressure I think those boys the, the, the players who are big players could have easily stepped up another level and uh, you know made it comfortable but um, but yeah, it's still you know one of those moments that I think in the world of football um, to be playing you know in one of the early games at Wembley, um, yeah, it's a, again a special moment and a privilege to I think for the clubs involved. So after that season, your career went full circle because you went online to where it all started. Back to Charlton. Back to Charlton. Yeah. What was that like to play? To go back, it was it was lovely. Yeah, in, in my in my eyes, I didn't know that that was going to be my sort of uh, last sort of uh, period of, of of football because I had just coming back from injury. I was hoping that I'd be getting back to form to get back at Pompey and be part of the Pompey team um, and potentially you know see out my playing days with Pompey, but. 
I had to go to Charlton to get some games, but while I was there, I knew that I wasn't the same player. Um, physically, uh, it, I was, the demands of playing back to back was very, very hard. Mentally, it was tough. And I suppose I, I came to a conclusion in my mind that, uh, you know, I can't go, I can't play anywhere else. If I'm going to play for anybody, it's got to be Pompey. Um, I can't play for anybody else. So, um, it was nice to go back. I scored a couple of goals. Um, it was nice again to see a number of, of staff who were there in the past and fans who remembered me as a little kid. Um, and I said that, you know, I went, I left Charlton as a, as a boy and I returned as a man. And, uh, and in my heart, I was hoping that I'd be able to help change the fortunes of Charlton and uh, help push them into promotion uh, places. But um, unfortunately, end up being part of a team that got relegated so uh, so that was difficult but it was nice to be able to go back there and um, you know give as much as I could in that time to, to try and help them go forward. You said that was your last real spell with any one team and you always hear from ex-professionals who've retired it's you know, the hardest decision they've ever had to make. You spoke there about knowing you weren't necessarily the player you had been before the injury mm. so did that make the decision to announce your retirement did that in a way make it easier decision to come to or was it still yeah it's still you know you, I, I've always been a fighter so if someone says that I can't uh, do something I'm going to prove them wrong so there was 60% of me knowing that actually Lynn this could be the end but there's 40% that said no don't give up because then it might just be you you know you get your second wind you know you, your legs might not feel good today but give it another three months they might feel strong you might be ready so I was in that sort of place but um, something that if you ask any footballer uh, today uh, at any stage of their their career uh, what's the thing they fear most and they'll say not playing football again but for me I was in a totally different space you know football as important as it was in my life wasn't the most important thing because my faith uh, at, at that point was um, uh, obviously becoming a Christian uh, had allowed me to have this freedom about my life that football was part of my life but it wasn't everything in my life so that moment of uh, admitting that football had come to an end or was coming to an end was quite easy um, because I knew there was something else planned for my life but there's still a little bit of me that said, is it now, is, is football finishing at this moment in time? So that was something that I had to wrestle with a little bit. Um, but once I made the decision, um, because again, because of injury, um, it was the right thing. And I just had this piece that said, yeah, football's over, uh, now onto the next chapter. Let's now follow that next chapter. You mentioned the faith there. Mm. When did you turn to faith. Yeah. So in 2001, I became a Christian and, and it was a, a, probably a three or four months before um, Aaron had uh, passed away, Aaron Flahaven had passed away. Um, and th the lead up to that was uh, the disappointment uh, as a 20 year old of being rejected at Charlton, uh, trying to find my identity through football. So. Um, you know, wanting to be a footballer, but never quite rating myself, um, struggling with uh, trying to prove myself, not wanting to face that rejection again, playing with fear, um, having everything, which when I say everything, you know, the, the life of a footballer, the finances of a footballer, but still not being happy. Um, it came to a head in 2001 when my wife wasn't well, and I just thought to myself, there's got to be more to life than this. And, um, and we got my we'd been invited to church locally and and to be honest I thought church was just the, about the building on a Sunday morning um, but then a guy got up to speak and he spoke about his life and feeling empty having it all and I thought to myself it sounds like he's talking about me and I thought well I've never told anybody that's how you know how I feel uh, because I didn't want to show any weakness and I remember leaving that church service thinking you know what I need to find out more about this uh, I was fortunate enough, my, my teammate Darren Moore was a Christian, 
So I used to ask him some questions about the faith and, um, and he'd give me some answers. I'd ask the guys in church the same questions, they had the same answers. I was thinking to myself, either Darren's phoning them up and telling them what answers to give me, <laughs> or this is real. And uh, probably after six weeks of going to that church and, and asking all these questions, I just came to that place where I thought, you know what, either they're mad or I'm missing something. And I could see in their hearts, in their eyes, I could see peace. And I wanted that peace. I, I was desperate for that peace. And um, and in the end, uh, you know, I went through a few more questions and I asked the guys at church, you know, about how did you become a Christian? And, uh, and they shared, uh, shared about Jesus dying for me so I could have a relationship with God. But more importantly, he rose on the third day. So, uh, so that, that if I believe that, then that's where my relationship with God starts, and um, and that was it. And to be honest, I, I I just thought it was about going to church, and and that'd be it. But um, but the the short version is it it over uh, the overspill hit my football career, um, it hit my teammates, um, it hit the fans, and it wasn't a case of me trying to. Uh, bash people over the head with the Bible. Uh, what was happening? My performances on the pitch were allowing me to speak about my faith, and um, and also allowed me to be in a position where, you know, I could help other people understand that the Christian faith isn't, you know, a, a something real crazy. It's very simple, and uh, and we ended up starting a charity called Faith and Football, and allowing that to to speak to to people as well. So. It really, it, it, it was a, a, an amazing moment. And I always say that's when my real life started in 2001. That's when my, my, you know, my proper life started. And the Faith and Football Foundation has been doing a lot of work since then. Mm. And that yeah. gave you a chance to combine the two things that had occupied your life yeah, for yeah. a large spell. So how have you found that? Because that's... And as you said before, that gave you something to for your life after football mm. and helped you adjust to yeah. life outside that bubble. I think what what that allowed, you know, and uh, you know, early on when we were talking about the uh, apprenticeships and doing other things um, to to build your character. Well, with faith in football, it allowed me to realise that I was more than a footballer. Um, you know, I ended up um, speaking publicly, which. You know, I'd never have done in my, never thought to have done before because I was too scared. Um, and and I was speaking publicly about my faith, it allowed me to interact with all sorts of different people, um, all walks of life, um, engaging with them and supporting them, and 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 again, seeing who I really was, and that that was the that was the main thing uh, that allowed me to to get to that place where actually, you know, as important as we think football is, there is much more to life. And, and Faith in Football gave me that platform uh, to do that. And, um, you know, it's allowed me to move out of the bubble um, because the, the bubble's not real. And uh, the reality uh, is that I was able to, to live in the real world whilst play football and knowing that football was just, again, part of me not not all of me and it gave me a freedom that, that's the biggest thing it gave me a freedom to to play football the way I wanted to play because I could see that the impact it was having on lives outside of football was quite special but um, the impact of my faith uh, not just in my life but my family's life and friends was allowing me to see that um, you know I can I can do so much more with my life than just uh, kick a ball and a, on, a, on a Saturday or a Tuesday. You spoke about the fact you found it. Where do you think you'd be if you hadn't mm. found religion? You know what? That's a that's a really good question. I probably wouldn't be sitting here in front of you now um, because uh, the, the the path or the journey I would have been on would have took me you know elsewhere. I'd have probably been chasing uh, this peace wherever that would have took me, whether that had been work. Uh, football coaching, management, um, so I know I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't be in a stable place. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of different things going on in my life that challenge me daily. Um, but because of um, 
because of my my belief, my my um, you know my foundation of Jesus in my life. Uh, that's allowed me to to make calculated decisions based on you know who He says that I am. And uh, when you when you're in that place, you know you you go you do make your own choices. You make your own decisions, but you, you can really sense a a, a quiet voice. Um, just guiding you and advising you and, and I think um, that's that's been a big part of me being able to say you know football was good it done it served uh, me for m many years but football has given me the platform to live the rest of my life and um, and it's given me an opportunity to to um, to do things that I never thought I'd do but ultimately uh, it's only through my faith in Jesus that has given me the strength to, to overcome a number of challenges. I'll give you an opportunity now to talk about the work that Faith in Football does and all the places that that's taken you since you set. Yeah, uh, where do we start? So, um, we've got four main programmes we run. Uh, one of them is called Extra Time Reading, so that's for children between the ages, uh, school age of year two and year three, um, and it's one-to-one -one reading uh, just to help the children who are underachieving. We run something called Business Enterprise Challenge, which is uh, students for year nine, senior school running businesses, and um, for a period of time, the work gets judged and the winning team go out to India to see the work we do out in India to, uh, with an orphanage. and. Um, we run a, a, a number of football projects where um, kids can come along and just play football and they're in a, an environment where they're encouraged uh, just to have fun and um, you know not you don't have to be the best football you can just come and kick a ball around and uh, we just started walking football as well uh, which is something that uh, we're really um, keen to to cover all areas of, of life um, and you know, uh, for us, it's a case of engaging uh, people at their point of need, and um, whatever that need is, we want to engage. So that's been good. Uh, we, we we work in different countries. We work in Uganda, India, um, Mexico, um, Philippines. We've done lots of work out there. We do lots of work locally with food banks. Uh, with clothing uh, and things like that. So again, it's it, wherever we feel we can help with a need, that's what we, we, we try and do. So it's, um, and, and, you know, again, I said it earlier that I've been, a, you know, it's been a pleasure really to be able to, to meet so many people um, in, in, in so many different walks of life. And it's opened my eyes up and given me the opportunity to, to appreciate again know what I've got and where I am um, but been able to help other people on their journey so after finding religion do you think it changed to link together two of the, the themes or the two main themes I suppose do you think it changed you as a player on the pitch mm, yeah without a doubt without a doubt you know I, like I said I played football with fear uh, for, for at least eight Eight to nine years uh, after that rejection from uh, from Charlton, and when when Harry Redknapp came in to to be the Portsmouth manager, he said, "Lim, you know, I'm going to let you go. We're going to, you know, sell you to you know for wherever it was. I can't remember how much it was, um, and you know, you we don't feel you have a future here. So obviously that disappointed me because the the fears come back about where I'm going to live. You know." Am I going to stay in football? You know, 28, 29 years old, what am I going to do with a job if no one wants me as a footballer? Um, and the chaplain, Mick Meadows, just said, Lynn, don't worry, you know, God's got a plan for your life. And that plan might be that you stay here, it might be that you go elsewhere. And I thought, well, he's hedging his bets, you know, saying that. But then he said, Lynn, don't worry about Harry, don't worry about the fans, just play for God. You know, he's given you a gift to play football, use that gift to play, uh, play for him and uh, everything else will take care of itself and you know it still didn't make sense and then he said uh, here's a bible verse for you and that bible verse was whatever you do in word or deed do it for god and i didn't understand it in terms of what how that related to me kicking a ball around 
But what I did understand was, um, Lynn, just give 100% for God. Whatever the outcome is, is that's going to be the outcome. And within two weeks, Harry says, Lynn, I'm not going to sell you. Your attitude's been spot on. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, the league season starts. I'm on the bench. Uh, Eddie Howe gets injured. I come on. I play in a position that I'm not, you know, comfortable with. And uh, end up playing the whole of that season. We get promoted to the Premier League and I win Player of the Year and a number of other awards. And people used to say to me, Lynn, you're a different person. What is it? And I, and I just told them, I play with, I play. Uh, with Pete's now, there's no, I've got no stress about how I'm going to perform because I play for God. And you know, the journalists were a little bit uh, saying, oh, what do you mean God? What, are you calling <laughs> Harry Redknapp God? And I'm like, no, no, not Harry, but you know, I've got Jesus in my life and God's given me a gift and I play for him. And, and people laughed and didn't understand it, but like I say, the evidence for many people was, uh, what I was doing on the pitch and because I was doing so much on the pitch that just didn't add up to what I was doing before it was an easy way to say you know it's because God's in my life and um, you know some people might have thought I was a good luck charm but there are other areas in my life where you know Bible verses were given to me and helped me get through uh, some good and and difficult times and and a lot of people forget as well that I had, you know, probably four years after that season, four years where the club were prepared to sell me or swap me. Um, but I just said, God, if you want me here, I'm playing for you. If you don't, I'm still playing for you. And in the end, I ended up spending 10 years here. So um, God's plan is bigger than any other man's plan. And it's allowed me to, to be involved in so many great things in the city, which has been, which has been amazing. You mentioned uh, Eddie Howe and looking at the England managerial situation just to get your thoughts on this. Mm. You mentioned Gareth Southgate. The one of those keeps getting battered about mm. is Eddie Howe. Yeah, I think personally, I know Eddie very well. I see him quite often, and uh, um, you know, he knows that the England job for him at this moment in time is not his job. Um, yeah, he, he wants to do a thorough job with Bournemouth. Um, I think he will have the opportunity to to manage a, a club that's going to be uh, in and around Europe. Um, and and I think at that point, you know, uh, whatever happens then will give him give you an indicator of you know how how well he could do at national level. Gareth Southgate, you know, he managed with Middlesbrough for a, for a number of years and done a pretty decent job um, but he also worked with the FA for a number of years so he's gained a lot of experience as a match day day-to-day uh, -day manager of a team but also seeing how it works at international level um, so hopefully Gareth will will settle in and do well and um, and Eddie can get on and be you know the, the league manager that he wants to be and um, off the back of that you know, if if his name still been mentioned in 10, 15 years time, then that's probably the right time. But I think at this moment in time, um, it wouldn't be fair, and it could be um, if it doesn't go well, it could um, you know hinder his uh, career in um, you know in the Premier League. Just to be asking a mischievous question, who <laughs> would you have gone for twenty twelve? Redknapp or Hodgson? Uh, Hodgson. Hodgson. Yeah. Yeah, you know Harry. Harry, great, and Harry will will get exactly what you um, you know what you want from your team. And the, but I think for uh, building a future for England, um, I think you know Hodgson laid the foundations. And unfortunately, we're in a society who wants success overnight. And and as if that Iceland result had changed, Hodgson would still be in charge. Um, so I think. You know, again, they were probably grooming Gareth Southgate for the job anyway, um, but probably for another two or three years' time. What have you made about all the stuff in the Telegraph in recent days? Yeah. Because that's something that was you know, a big part of your life for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you ever know that there was this? Or did yeah. you ever suspect? <laughs> probably more suspect than no. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in terms of what? Sorry. 
in terms of what's been emerging in the Telegraph. Oh, right. Well, yeah, you hear, you, you always hear rumours, uh, you hear rumours of all sorts of things. And, and again, I think this is the, the, the whole thing about society, um, that in, you know, in business, uh, if somebody does a deal and, you know, the, someone's then taken away on holiday, um, as part of that deal, is that considered, you know, a bung? Is it considered, a, you know, a sweetener or anything like that? I just think in the world of football, um, there's been too, it's been too open. Um, the world of football has been too open to uh, corruption from the top to the bottom, and um, and I think now that you know things are being closed in and people are being um, found out about stuff. Uh, I think it, you know, if it goes on, it it will very it will be very difficult now uh, because you know too many people are aware. But like I say, um, if it was just the managers, then you say it's a problem. If it was just the FA, then you say it's a problem. If it was just UEFA, then it'd be a problem. If it was just FIFA, then it'd be a problem. But uh, when you look at it, the whole of the football world has had um, some sort of um, corruption within and uh, hopefully this comes to the point where people will know that they can't get away with what they used to get away with.